All right, well, welcome everybody to this Business of Speaking show. I am your host, Tim McDonald, and today I am so fortunate to be joined by somebody that I've had the pleasure of knowing for several years now and just got to work with him on a project um, early in 2020 called Speak Aid 2020, Dan Pontfract. How are you doing, Dan? Tim! Uncle Tim! Brother Tim! <laughs> him! Uh, it's so good to see you. It's so good to be on your show. I'm so thrilled uh, to be able to impart any type of uh, experience or wisdom or knocks that I've taken in this, uh, the business of speaking. But more importantly, thanks for the invite. You are an amazing human being and have been for, for your life, obviously, but since I probably met you in 2014-ish, I think, somewhere around there. I think that was right around the time of uh, of when your first book, I think, was coming out, uh, Flat <laughs> Army. Um, so, um, you know, and for those uh, that might not have watched this show before, really what it is, is it's not to focus on what the speakers talk about on the stage, but their journey on how they got started to the stage and what they've learned since they've been up on the stage. So um, if you are thinking about getting in started in speaking, are just starting in speaking, or as 2020 has taught us, no matter what you thought you knew about speaking, <laughs> we never know what, what the world has planned for us. Um, this is a show for you and a community for you. So with that being said, Dan, um, I'd love to kind of kick off with, you know, telling your story of how you got started in speaking. Wow. Well, I, I believe uh, I was potentially put on this earth to be on a stage or more importantly, what I just call in front of people to help. Um, when I was a kid, Tim, uh, when I say kid, I mean sort of in my 12 to 16 year old self, uh, I was on stage in plays. You know, I was Tom Sawyer, I was Huck Finn. Uh, I was in all sorts of different things that in Hamilton where I grew up uh, in Ontario. Uh, and the theater was something for me where I could unleash, uh, I suppose, my desire to be creative in an artistic form in front of people. Um, now I was an athlete and I was an academic. This was sort of like a third dimension to me and I really enjoyed it. But then kind of when I turned 16, I got really heavily into soccer uh, and girls and working at the grocery store. And so it sort of took a back seat. In fact, it just disappeared. But what ensued over uh, the following years was this penchant uh, to help. And ultimately, I ended up at McGill University in Montreal. I thought I was going to be a doctor and or a physiotherapist. I ended up being an educator. So I got my BA, I got my BA, Bachelor of Education. And I, I knew that that was a way for me to help, but also kind of be on stage. So Denise and I, my infinitely better half, and I uh, picked up out of Montreal, got married, moved to Vancouver, and became a teacher of high school for about two years. It was lovely, you know, because every day we were kind of on stage, if you will, helping. So it kind of married these two ideas of mine to be on stage and to help. So, but I realized then as well after the second year that maybe there's more to helping and, if you will, speaking than just in a classroom with 20 to 30 kids. So I went into higher ed and in higher education for about five years is again a, a different audience but still in front so i'm a director of a bunch of high-tech professional career changing programs cohort-based model and you know i on friday afternoons i'd be able to what was called facilitate open dialogue about how things are going in their program their lives their career changes etc and it was a lot of two hour sessions of extemporaneous hey what you doing how can i help and weaving in stories so then I entered into the corporate world, uh, switching from education and higher ed into the corporate world, Tim. And it was then in 2002, where as a chief learning officer, I started delivering talks. And those talks were in conferences, right? It was in the organization. And that was in 2002. And then by the time I joined a telecom in 2008, I was now kind of quote, I would say on the circuit. <laughs> and the circuit becoming, uh, I was the kind of one of those guys that people would ask to be at these conferences to speak about learning and leadership and education and culture and engagement. And so it really, uh, it, it gave me a long runway to fixing and honing my craft, uh, which ultimately became my business, 
uh, or at least part of my business, um, right around, I would say, yeah, 2013, 2014, when we met and the books started coming out and I complimented books with speaking, with consulting, and that's where I've been doing for the last five or six years. Yeah, no, it's, I'm just always curious um, because I've, I've heard a lot of speakers have been in the classroom or, you know, at one point before they actually started doing speaking professionally uh, outside of the classroom. And I'm just kind of curious, was there a different feeling for you when you were getting up on stage, um, you know, not in front of a class, but in front of a different group of people that maybe you didn't know? Yeah, well, there's there's different types of talks. I don't know if we'll get into that, but you know, there's the keynote, um, there's the sort of facilitated dialogue chat, if you will. Sometimes fireside chats, sometimes you know, um, panels, right? And you're still on stage, but but then there's yeah, there's there's times in which I would still call it a a talk. You're speaking, but it's more an extemporaneous you know, a massive coaching call. And it's, it's me or whomever engaging with the audience uh, as if you're doing a bit of off the cuff stand up, like how stand up uh, comics might do when they engage with the audience and they make it really funny. In these cases, I'm making it a, more of a coaching conversation with an audience. So first of all, I've learned that there's different types of talks for sure, but you're right. The question about, you know, coming from a classroom or even if, like I taught phys ed for a while as well. So, you know, big classes of 50 to 70 kids in large gymnasiums or, or pitches or field graphs, right? It's different, obviously, because in some cases, if you're doing the formal keynote, let's say it's 45 or 60 minutes, you better have a plan to do a good intro, make sure it's a good story, you know, make sure that there's some levity, some self-deprecation, and then you better have some sort of arc <laughs> And then a conclusion, and whether you're making them cry or feel good or both, you know, that's, that's a different art than the lesson in teaching. But getting up on stage and being able to do it and, and know when to look at people in the audience, know when to take a break and when to pause, you know, when to rise and up and down with the emotions of the room, that's a, that's a classroom technique. Uh, to be honest, and I've taken that, those classroom techniques or gymnasium techniques and, and put that on the stage. Wow, no, that's, it's pretty interesting um, that, you know, there are certain things that we need to still learn um, as we get into this. Now, I know, you know, when you work for a corporation and you have the opportunity to get out and speak in front of whether it's teams, employees, or, you know, in industry, you know, events, um, you know, you still have the comfort of having a paycheck from your employer. What made you, or when did you know it was right for you to kind of embark on this on your own instead of having that kind of guarantee of a paycheck? It's a great question. One, it's a question I think, Tim, that I, I'm often getting from folks that are working in, in organizations, be it public sector, not-for-profit, or obviously for-profit corporations. You know, you're, it's... I have been privileged, uh, quite frankly, to have been able to be remunerated for many years by you know, a high tech company, by a telecom company, and, and hone that craft, if you will, of becoming, getting on stage and not having to worry about what I'm charging for a keynote or, or not, and how many keynotes I could do pro bono. They were all pro bono. <laughs> I mean, that's just how it, it was. So, I guess, you know, Dory Clark, who's a dear friend and also just an amazing guest you probably have on the show. You know, Dory long ago had figured out um, how to have income streams, uh, varied income streams. And so as much as I believe that there is a lot of uh, goodness and, and, and heart and giving that comes of speaking, I don't think it can be the one thing that you do. I think that there are there is a need to have multiple revenue streams, if you will, if you're about to go out on your own. So for me, you know, revenue streams of speaking in my, if I look back in 2018, 2019, halfway through 2020 or so, uh, speaking is about a third of what I do revenue wise. It may not be a third time wise because it ebbs and flows. Sometimes I'm gonna spend a lot of time on new material, on ways in which to help a particular client. So even though it might be a one hour keynote, it's about 30 hours of work to get it right and then to practice it, right? 
Uh, but other times there are, there are keynotes where I know that I've delivered it perhaps one way for one client or a conference, I can tweak it and then, you know, do it slightly differently, but not spend as much time. So the point being is that it's about one third of revenue and the other two thirds of my revenue streams are things like writing or things like coaching, things like consulting, um, things like doing assessments and so forth. So again, it's a long way to answer. I'm sorry, Tim, but if I'm asking and if someone's asking me, what did you do to get into the speaker world? Well, I didn't just think I was going to be a speaker. No, I think that's very valuable and um, very helpful to, to so many people because, I mean, that was one of the things I had thought when I was <laughs> going to do it was I just wanted to be on stage, you know, and I'm still trying to figure out that, that element of it. And I know a lot of other people will be too. So um, one thing that, that I'm kind of curious about because I see so many authors writing books and, yeah, and yeah. so many speakers are, you know, do you call them a speaker? Or do you call them an author? Right. Cause they're both up on stage. So what, um, how do you view yourself and how do they both complement each other? Uh, I am an author. I am a speaker. Uh, but first and foremost, I'm an, I'm a leadership strategist and the leadership strategist insignia, if you will, is one that gives birth to being a speaker, an author, a coach, a consultant, uh, a, a learning designer for all the online learning uh, courses and things that I've built. Those are the, almost the outputs of be, being the leadership strategist. So, so my job is to sort of say, look, Dan has ways in which he can support you. Uh, I'd love to be on stage. I, I mean, it's great. I'd love to be in a facilitated workshop with 20 people online or face to face. I'd love to go into your organization and just sit with employees and, and listen to their stories and understand how the culture is going on. I'd like to go in and help you build out a learning program or a leadership model. So whatever your um, thing is, your expertise, in my case, it's leadership and culture and engagement and people and organizations and org design. I just call myself a leadership strategist. And then how I, how I deliver on that expertise comes in those either revenue streams or channels or, or verticals, whatever you want to kind of uh, think of them as. So if you're a, um, an expert in CPG or the retail industry, you know, maybe you want to call yourself a retail strategist or, you know, a retail thought guru or whatever. I don't really care, but you get the point, right? It's what's your expertise and then go from there on how you can deliver uh, modes of excellence so people can can learn from you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you mentioned um, that you had a lot of different revenue streams built in from the beginning when you launched out on your own. Um, did, was it obvious what they were or how did you kind of figure out which revenue streams were going to be the right fit for you? Wow. Uh, I suppose... Yeah, to each their own, because there are some dear friends of mine that probably have a 90% um, revenue stream on speaking and sort of 10% other. So it just sort of fill your boots depends on your fancy. Uh, and, and I'm not knocking folks that are doing all speaking all the time as their mode of revenue. I, what I did was I looked at myself and said, do I want to speak all the time? And, and that was a, a, an answer that I often said no to. A, three goats we're raising, Denise and I, lots of travel. Now, obviously, it's mitigated a bit to a degree with the pandemic. Well, it's mitigated a lot, isn't it? But that's kind of where I'm going with, right? It's, a, it's an opportunity for you to say, what's the right mix? And if you're a speaker X who wants to speak at 90%, good on you. But if you're someone like me who believes that, you know, there's perhaps more ways in which for you to address uh, your talent as a quote leadership strategist, then you, know, you, might, you might have to kind of mess around a little bit to find out what the right mix is. And again, I'll say this, Tim, like we all have rent to pay and mortgages to pay and groceries to pay and school clothes to pay for and so on, right? So I'm not saying that um, you shouldn't take on more speaking gigs if it's gonna help you get to the right, I guess, uh, repertoire, the mix. Um, so don't, don't hear me as if I'm being uh, pompous and saying, oh, you should do it. This, no, you got to do what works for you to pay the bills, right? 
But if you can get into a groove eventually that allows you to say, I want to do 20 keynotes a year. Uh, and those 20 keynotes I know are going to revolve around 20 times three, three days, because it's a day to travel-ish, maybe it's two days, maybe it's a day of prep, right? And kind of, you know, eight or nine hours of content. And maybe your formula is four. So, so it's four times 20, that's 80, 80 days of a calendar. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's a lot of time. But that could be you looking at saying 20 keynotes equals 80 days. Okay, that's a, just about a quarter of my working days. That means I've got 25% of time and revenue dedicated to the 20 keynotes. What am I gonna do with the other 75 or how can I complement it? Maybe you start out with, I wanna do 60 keynotes. Maybe you wanna, because you wanna get there, you start at 20 and then you get to 40, you get to 60 over a five year plan. Whatever it is, I'm a math guy. Like one of my minors was math. So I always look at it sort of mathematically and say, how am I going to spend my time and how do I want that pie graph to look as I'm building out my repertoire of skills? No, that's very good, very good. Um, you mentioned uh, Dory Clark as one yeah. of the people. Um, so I'm just kind of curious, I, I, it sounds like you've had influences and people that have helped you along the way. Um, what have been your biggest resources for you know really evolving and growing your business resources uh from a resource perspective i think being first of all a an autodidact and a ridiculously curious person <laughs> has helped me in my sort of lifelong journey um uh definition and, th and that that to me is everything about who i am today i am ridiculously asking questions about people, about process, about how to's, about how did they's. And all of that goes into my head plus Evernote. And I kind of, I tack it, I tack, I write down a lot of little pointers. So I may, you know, someone, someone sends me a TED talk and I'll, I'll look at it just to see style, content, you know, storytelling, what have you, if we're kind of uh, talking about speaking here. When I'm at, if I'm asked to speak at a conference, you know, I'll try to be there for the speaker before or the bit of the speaker after to get to see and hear and feel and smell what that style is like. Both the good and the bad in the sense of what I would do and what I wouldn't do, right? The good for me, the bad for me, because my style is one that's different, but I could learn and maybe hone it a little bit. So there's particular people that have done an incredible job of just speaking and I've learned from that. And I, again, whether videos or face to face, but similarly, you know, whether it's Dory or, or lots of great folks that have done the, an incredible job of building up the repertoire of options. Uh, I find, um, I, 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 I find like I'm no one when I look at them and see what they've done. But that said, it pushes me in, in, in kind of my continuous, um, addiction to improving myself to see, well, look at how they've done it. Maybe I could do that this way. Um, I, another uh, dear friend and example is Michael Bungay Stanier. So he of uh, author of the coaching habit and the advice trap. So Michael and I go back longer than you and I probably to 2010, uh, probably 10 years now. And MBS as he's affectionately known as, you know, uh, helped build up a, a company called box of crayons that helps, people essentially become better versions of themselves. And it, it was kind of a learning and development company. And then it turned into a kind of leadership development and a coaching company. And he built this up from nothing all the while uh, writing, I think he's at his sixth book now, and also speaks and facilitates and, and builds out these learning modules. And it's just, he's, I'm in awe of Michael and his ability to, build out the repertoire all the while being an engaging and funny yet heartfelt speaker when he's on stage. So I think we're, I, I look at myself as being in the vortex and shadows of the Dorries and Michaels learning from them and trying to find ways in which to weave that into what I'm, what I'm doing. Yeah. I can't believe our time is just flying by, but one question I have before we kind of get uh, into wrapping up is knowing everything that you know now, and I, I, you know, for most people, I can say, go back to when you started speaking, but I know you started uh, <laughs> probably back when you were in your teens. Um, so back when you were like kind of in the, the corporate world, getting ready to think about launching on your own, um, 
what advice would you give yourself that you know now to that younger self of Dan? Hmm. Um, what a great question. I would, if I'm looking back at myself and saying, if you were to do it differently, um, or he, okay, here's the best way I would describe this is the audience, um, is like a classroom. And when you're a teacher in the classroom, unfortunately, you're not always going to reach everyone. And whether it is a personality thing, or it's a learning thing, or it's a distraction thing, or it's just a I'm uninterested in you thing, or the content. Uh, inevitably, you will uh, receive like I did as a as an educator as a teacher, as a prof, you receive evaluations. And when something happened with me for some reason that I thought, oh, all of a sudden now you're in the corporate world, you're in corporate conferences and events, the evals are gonna be smoking hot, 99%, this guy's awesome, because he's funny, he's engaging, he's on stage, look at his hats, look at those shoes, what great shirts, like it's a different, like you kind of, you do a little bit of a persona change, at least I do to pay homage to my, my buddy Gore Downey of the, of the hip here in Canada. And what I recognized <laughs> was that the audience is a lot like the classroom in that you are going to get all wild differences of opinion in the audience. And then when you kind of go back to the evals, uh, you are going to get some haters. And the haters are like, this guy's an idiot. Why is he wearing a hat? You know, why is he telling me how to lead? I know how to lead. And again, you can't focus on the five or six or X number of negative Nellies that are out there. Because uh, that'll, that'll get you weirded out. And unfortunately, Tim, I think I was weirded out for the first few years because I would get those and think, oh, my God. And it wasn't until two or three or four, maybe five years into sort of the circuit and conferences, et cetera, I realized you can't please everyone, Tim, in an audience, and that's okay. So that's my, that's my lesson to myself if I was kind of looking back and speaking to a younger Dan. Well, thank you. And I know you have a new book out, uh, Lead Care Win. Um, I'm just kind of curious, what was the kind of the inspiration or the thought for this book. Have it, I have one copy, <laughs> Tim. Uh, Lead Care Win, How to Become a Leader Who Matters is a book uh, that, it, it just, I know, it sounds horribly pretentious and arrogant, Tim, but it had to be written. And the reason it had to be written was that I've just uh, come across far too many organizations and employees and leaders whom have sort of somewhat somewhere along the way missed the plot on what leaders are supposed to be doing. And so there are nine uh, behaviors that I make reference to in this book that resurrect, this is nothing new, it resurrects what a more caring, empathic, concerning type of leader ought to be doing, both leader of self and leader of others. And it just to me is one of those where we need to be more patient we need to be better listeners. We need to build relationships and champion others. We need to be the curiosity-based uh, individual. You know, we need to commit to balance with equity, diversity, and inclusivity. There, there, it's, just, it's a book that is resurrecting all of the goodness that has come before us into a compact nine lesson uh, field guide uh, to remind people how, how important it is and what to do to sort of take them back to where uh, it ought to be. Leadcarewin.com is the easiest way to go find out about that book. Well, fantastic. I'm looking forward to reading it because I just got my copy. So um, tell, us, tell everybody where they can find that book and how they can get in touch and learn a little bit more about you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much again, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here. Again, you're such a good friend. Uh, the, the book itself is available anywhere. So it's, um, you know, go online, visit a local bookshop, get them to order it in. If it's not there for you, uh, I'd love to support your independent bookshops. Uh, but yeah, leadcarewin.com, uh, best way to go there. From there, you can kind of get some bios about me and find out what I'm up to. And what I'm really excited about, it's the first time I'm releasing an entire uh, online leadership development program with the book. 
So it's, uh, it's pretty compelling. There's about an hour of core material for each of the nine lessons and then upwards of two hours of bonus material on each of the nine lessons. And it's, it's been a treat the last three months putting this thing together. So looking forward to releasing that as well. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And thank you for watching and tuning in with us today. Um, again, if you're new to the show, um, one thing that we do is we stop the broadcast here in just a minute. Um, so, but I have a special surprise for any of our email subscribers because Dan agreed to stay on with me and answer one additional question. So we're gonna record that, but not put it on YouTube. So if you wanna get that information, head over to business.speaking or speaking.business, I'm sorry, I'm like the business is speaking show, <laughs> um, but speaking.business and sign up for our free weekly email newsletter. And that's where you will get this exclusive content. So thank you for, uh, for watching today and thank you for joining us, Dan. Oh, so good of you, Tim. Thanks everyone.